good afternoon everyone and thank you for your continued interest in, in our business. Looking back at FY21, it was clearly a challenging year for all businesses and from our perspective, uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank our team for acquitting themselves so well. Despite the uh, operational confines and challenges of uh, COVID, we have managed once again to uh, deliver to our, our customers to the, the maximum uh, degree uh, possible. And um, the, the year has shown that uh, we have a very resilient business and that we have a very resourceful and, and flexible team ar around the world. It's also a year where just before the financial year commenced, we completed our largest ever acquisition, uh, CSS Industries, which we completed in March. And certainly in terms of our integration plans, we didn't have a global pandemic on the radar. But despite that, we have delivered synergies ahead of time and ahead of expected value during the year. And we are delighted with that. CSS is already delivering great value to the group. In terms of our ESG agenda, we've raised the bar once again, and we will explain that later on in this presentation, but very much focused on our people, our products, and of course, our impact on the, on the planet. We will talk about our key strategic drivers later in the presentation, but clearly uh, working with the winners, the winning customers, the winning channels, and the winning uh, products is very much a part of our ongoing focus. And that's really helped us deliver to the optimum results achievable during the last year. Again, we'll talk about how that impacts on our future prospects later in the presentation. As for the current financial year, FY22, uh, we are in good shape to deliver strong year-on-year -year growth in terms of revenues and certainly in terms of uh, earnings per share. Uh, and uh, we are very excited to, to share with you our growth plans uh, for the future. We see significant growth both organically and through M&A opportunities to drive the top line through to one and a half billion dollars and to double uh, EBITDA. And we will uh, drill down into how we're going to achieve that later on the presentation like to give you just an overall flavor of what our business looked like in FY21. Well, we saw significant revenue growth, which uh, Giles will explain, but the profile of that revenue, I think, is quite interesting. For those of you who've known our business for many years, you would have known us as very much a Christmas products-focused business. And over the years, we have tried to reduce our dependency on the Christmas season, which is still very important to us, but clearly we wanted to generate revenues all year round. Well, we've transformed our business over recent years, and we now see that 57% of our revenues are now non-Christmas orientated, and we are making profit for most months during the year, and our first half, second half revenues are now pretty similar. Subsequent to our acquisition of CSS earlier in the year, our revenues are now over 70% based in the United States. And that's now more representative in terms of where the demand for our products exists proportionately on a regional basis, with the United States being the biggest consumer in the world for our product categories. In terms of revenue by source, we are effectively a trading business with a very strong manufacturing arm. Our manufacturing activities are now are on a co common platform in uh, the UK, in uh, Europe, and also in the United States. Giles will explain later how the uh, impact of, of COVID affected the overall levels of manufacturing that we had within our group. And now in terms of uh, revenue by product category, the good news is, is that every category grew in value terms during the year. Our celebrations business as a whole grew by uh, 10% and for the first time exceeded half a billion dollars. But it was not all plain sailing. There were certain categories which were significantly impacted by uh, COVID. And some examples of that would be, uh, for example, within our celebrations category, uh, Christmas crackers are a, a, we're the world's largest producer of Christmas crackers and a significant 
level of demand for those products will be through the leisure industry, through restaurants, through hotels, et cetera. And clearly lockdown had a big impact on those. Similarly, in our not for resale or consumables business, the bags that we produce that are given away by beauty and fashion retailers, they were in lockdown. That curtailed demand for those categories. But overall, our volumes by category have grown uh, significantly during the year. And if we take the two key uh, buckets of celebrations products and also a craft and creative play uh, products, we're very much committed to those uh, categories. We see tremendous growth opportunities for the future under those uh, key headings. And we'll drill down Uh, into that later in the presentation. But first, I know Giles is ready to share with you the results for FY21. So over to you, Giles. Hi, thanks, Paul, and good afternoon. Yeah, just in terms of our highlights, uh, revenue was up um, 40% to $873.2 million. Uh, Within that, the driver of growth was very much the CSS acquisition where we got the full year effect of revenues. However, we did see COVID have an impact on our like-for-like revenues, which were down 5% for the DG group. And if we look at the pro forma position of CSS, we were down 1% year on year. So overall, um, revenues held back because of COVID, but we see a big jump because of the full year effect of the acquisition we did at the end of last year. In terms of our adjusted profits, $37 million, 4.4% up year on year. And this is where we see a more significant impact from COVID, where the operating margins were down year on year. The impact of operational deleverage as we see those lower volumes coming through the business. Um, And uh, I'll talk more about that on the next slide. Pleasing was our net cash position, which was up 24.1 million to $76.5 million, very much reflected our strong cash generation and our strong cash management approach that we took to COVID during the last 12 months and the continuation of the trend that we had seen over recent years. So if we dig a little bit more into the detail of the income statement, we can start to see a little bit more detail on the split across the two main regions. So in the Americas, unsurprising was the 73% increase in revenues, very much driven by the CSS acquisition, primarily located in the US. International was actually down 4% and sort of hides a little bit of a split in terms of performance. We actually had relatively robust performances in Australia and in Europe, but actually the UK was held back primarily because of the uh, the seasonal bias of that revenue mix um, uh, in, in, in the UK. So COVID impacting the UK probably the most of all of our territories. In terms of our adjusted profit then, yes, we saw an increase year on year in both Americas and in international. But as I say, the operating margin was held back and actually declined year on year. When we look behind that, we see a change in both customer and product mix, which hasn't necessarily been helpful, but also more specifically, we've seen lower volumes going through our business, which impacts on two things. The first is the absorption of overhead into our inventory. And secondly, just a general operational deleverage against the fixed costs that we have in our business. Specifically though, and and this is the interesting sort of factor that our manufacturing volumes were down 15 percent year on year so like for like manufacturing volumes down 15 percent compared to that decline in in revenues like for like decline in revenues of five percent and of course that's where we have quite significant investments both in terms of uh, warehousing and uh, fixed costs and that sort of brings to life the operational deleverage that uh, resulted an impact on those margins. So a difficult, more difficult year from a, an operating margin perspective, but overall we saw growth in our operating profit and also obviously our adjusted profit. More specifically around certain other areas of the PL, the underlying finance charge went down, 
and that really reflects on our cash management and we'll look at that a little bit more on the next page but we also had the full year effect of the IFRS 16 impact on finance charge as a result of the CSS acquisition so despite that though we saw a decline in our financing charge tax Tax now really is very much a reflection of the different statutory rates around the world and the regions in which we operate and where we make the mix of profits. So up at 25.4 and where it will be there broadly about there over the next 12 months as well. So tax is pretty stable going forward. And really the final point is in terms of adjusting items, which although were down about 14 million year on year, they were still there at 22 million, of which the biggest proportion is primarily the CSS integration and uh, synergies costs and the cost of realization for those. So that's our P&L in a bit more detail. And if we flip to the next slide, we can see um, a bit more information about the cash flow. So overall, as I said, we generated $24.1 million of net cash and increased our closing balance to $76.5 million. And you can see here we have some good control around working capital where we see the first full year of CSS being within those working capital movements, particularly nice to see inflows in inventory and generally good control across all working capital, which is reflected in that chart you can see on the right hand side where you see our level of working capital has been strongly controlled throughout the year with the level of peak debt significantly reduced year on year. And I'll come back to that in a second. Adjusting items is an interesting one because it's a relatively small number versus the P&L charge. And really that reflects the fact that during the year we received just over $17 million of tax refund in the US in relation to CSS net operating losses, which we acquired as part of the deal. So quite a nice speedy return in terms of cash in relation to that, but very much a one-time event really being driven by the CARES Act um, in, in the US that's allowed us to um, access losses going back uh, further than previously before. CapEx was down. Um, no real major projects in the year as compared to prior years. So more of a normalized level of CapEx on a maintenance basis but also reflecting the fact that uh, we were tightening our belts a little bit around COVID and the cash management actions that we took there. And generally, if we then look down the rest of the income statement, we see movements that reflect a lot of the things that happened around the CSS acquisition and the full year effect of that. So whether that be um, the lease liabilities charge or even the dividend paid, where um, obviously now we have higher level of shares uh, being uh, an issue and that impacts on the level of dividend paid. So overall, a good, strong performance in cash. And as I say, if we look at the chart around net cash debt by month, you can see a significant decline year on year in the level of debt that we have during peak periods. And that really reflects two things. One, a lower level of activity in the business, so less manufacturing, less uh, working capital to employ. But also, it also reflects the fact that there's been a change as a result of CSS, which is a much more everyday business. There's been a change in the overall profile and their peak was uh, their peak in working capital was earlier than ours. And, and uh, the, they then contributing to um, the uh, net cash position um, in during that uh, peak that we have. So overall, it flattens the overall curve, which is which is really helpful. And we like that. Unsurprisingly, as we've said, the profits didn't come through in the way that we would hope to because of the impact of COVID and the EPS drops down. And the reason it drops down is because without those profits coming through, the increases coming through that we expected following CSS, but we did issue the shares. So the shares bring that uh, EPS down. We have maintained, however, the dividend at uh, the same level as the prior year, very much reflecting that uh, strong cash management position that we've delivered in 2021. And overall, as that chart indicated on the cash flow page, the lower level of debt throughout the year um, has meant that we have delivered a, a position of average leverage, which is zero throughout the whole year. So a significant improvement um, on the prior year. Uh, so without any further ado, over to Paul. Thank you, Charles. Well, the year really demonstrated the three key strategic drivers that have driven the business forward over the last number of years were just as relevant, in fact, even more 
relevant last year. Working with the winners, who are the key retailers that we will deploy uh, most of our resources to? They enjoyed greater market share than ever before. Those trends were happening pre-COVID. They've just accelerated since COVID. And uh, all of those uh, top 20 retailers grew uh, with us both organically and uh, through the acquisition of CSS from 61% of our sales to 67% of our sales. And we see that trend continuing over the next few years, perhaps up to 75% uh, of our sales. Uh, the demands of um, COVID and the confines, certainly operationally, were significant, as I highlighted earlier. Our delivery to customers was excellent, and that was pretty tough to achieve. It was recognized by Walmart once again. We received supplier of the year within our product categories at Walmart. That's the second time in the last three years. We think that is a big statement about our ability and it's a, a badge of uh, credibility as well. And it, it creates great opportunities uh, for the future. As we've said previously, it's not just about price. Price is a given. You have to be competitive. But dependability, compliance, and showing that you are uh, uh, competent on a multifaceted basis is critical. And we've certainly uh, delivered that despite the challenges of COVID. The other thing I think which is very interesting is that our top 20 customers have reinvented themselves over the last number of years. They're not just superstores, they have convenience stores, they have an omni-channel presence, including very mature and very successful and fast-growing e-commerce platforms. So our e-commerce strategy includes the e-commerce strategy of our customers, and this is seeding growth opportunities for us, which are very exciting. We'll dig into those soon. Uh, so working with the winners, working with the winning customers, working with the winning categories and channels is a key strategy. And what makes us appealing to those uh, customers? Well, one of the things is certainly our design and product innovation capability. For the first time ever, we actually designed and delivered over 100,000 SKUs to those customers. This is an immense resource from their perspective. This is across our brands, our customer brands, and licensed brands. So we really are ever increasingly a one-stop shop partner for those customers who are consolidating their supply base and we're a beneficiary of that. Very importantly, as you can see on that slide, design group brands that we own, where we're in the driving seat in terms of design, in terms of specification, now represent 40% of our sales. That's up massively from where it previously was. Customers are certainly happy to take our designs, happy to take our brands and to leverage the scale, enjoy the benefits of that, that our brands represent across territories. And we see that trend continuing strongly. Now, some of that is because of the growth in e-commerce driven revenues, where brand profile and our activities on social media to promote those uh, uh, brands have become more and more relevant. We're very excited about that. The third leg of our stall from a strategic perspective is efficiency and scale. And clearly, efficiency becomes more and more important, particularly in the, the current environment, which is significantly inflationary in terms of uh, material costs and certainly in terms of sea freight costs. So being able to manufacture, source, and distribute efficiently uh, becomes more and more important, and it, it helps us maintain a, a competitive uh, stance. Uh, again, as you will see, for the first time ever, we've actually sold over a billion units of uh, product this year. Vast complexity, but you know we we like to um, be in a position where what is impossible for other uh, businesses to achieve uh, is challenging for us, certainly, but we can deliver great service levels, 
across a tremendous portfolio of products and brands for our customers. So those three strategic drivers are more and more uh, relevant and important for us and critically create tremendous growth opportunities for the future. So let's talk about those growth plans. As we've stated, we see a path towards revenues going from the current levels of just under $900 million to $1.5 billion. We believe that we can achieve this with our existing customer base, with our existing product categories, approximately 30% of that growth to be achieved organically. So that's approximately $250 million. The balance through M&A, very much in the world of celebrations products and craft and creative play uh, products in terms of our M&A agenda, but we absolutely have line of sight to deliver both the organic and the M&A agenda that we have. What are the growth drivers? Working with the winners, as I said before, those customers are consolidating their supply base. Our shopping list is getting longer and longer. We found that particularly in the last year, uh, you know, it was challenging for us on the supply chain uh, side. It was impossible for a lot of uh, companies, and we've we've come out of this challenging period in in pretty good shape. So we're seeing more and more opportunities with those powerhouse. Uh, customers that we have. We also like the fact that um, we are now operating across different seasons. We are not just a Christmas product solution provider, but we are now delivering 57% of our revenues in non-Christmas areas. We see growth across all seasons and across all categories. To give you a flavor of that, we doubled our revenues in the minor seasons categories, so Halloween and Valentine's and Easter, Father's Day, Mother's Day, et cetera. I think our revenues went from just over 30 to just over $60 million. We see lots of possibilities there. As I mentioned before, our own brands are becoming more and more an important part of our overall revenues. We can see that the current 40% of revenues can grow to 70% of revenues in the next number of years, both organically and also through the M&A targets that we would hope we will be able to deliver. So organic opportunities and M&A opportunities, but that's from a revenue perspective. More importantly, we can double EBITDA, and that will be through a mix of product mix. It will be a, a mix of driving economies of scale through leveraging certainly the buying power that we have across the different product areas. We still see fast payback opportunities from a capital projects perspective. To give you a sense of that, if we look back probably in the last five or six years, I would say the average payback has been between three and a half to four years on a typical capital projects. And there's lots of opportunities for us to identify and execute on those. And finally, from a a cross-selling and operational synergies point of view, yes, we certainly hit the ground running in terms of of CSS, and we've delivered ahead of time and ahead of uh, our value expectations in year one. But that's not the end of the story. There's still plenty of self-help opportunities that we can uh, deliver on. So in that blend of uh, product profile, of leveraging economies uh, of of, uh, scale, we see a path to doubling our EBITDA, uh, both organically and through uh, M&A. So further insight to where are those opportunities? Where do they exist by region, organically, or by category? We can explain on the next slide. So as you can see, existing revenues, 873 million. If we look at our existing customers and existing categories, we see that the share of wallet that we have, the share of our customers spend, the opportunity is to target $4 billion of incremental existing spend. And we have been, we believe, conservative and grounded in our expectations that we can grow from 873 to $1.5 billion. Lots to play for. We're very dominant in certain categories, but we're not in others. 
and yet our customers are looking to us to provide them with a greater and broader breadth and depth of certain product categories. So within Celebrations, which is our single biggest business, we see that certainly in the card category and the party category, there are opportunities to grow. Some of the businesses that we're looking at have some very, very interesting uh, e-commerce um, activities within their, their uh, business. That's very interesting to us. But primarily, we see ourselves growing within Celebrations and craft and creative play and lots and lots to go for. And we're excited about the scale of opportunity that exists. The M&A uh, targets that we are looking at, we believe if we are able to deliver on these targets, will be within multiples of EBITDA, which is similar to those that we have acquired in the past. We see this as, as being highly accretive opportunities. So I thought it would be interesting because the top 20 customers are so important as part of our uh, growth strategy that we dig a little bit deeper and give you some insight into who are those customers and what's happening with them. What is fascinating is that uh, our products are present in approximately 220,000 stores worldwide, a tremendous footprint. But our top 20 customers actually are active in 40% of that 220,000 base, so 91,000 stores. They are also on average growing their store portfolio by 3% a year, i.e. over 2,500 more stores a year, and we're benefiting from that. So they're growing organically, they're growing by channel in convenience stores and certainly by uh, their e-commerce platforms. They're also growing regionally, uh, we're trading with many customers across different regions. And at the same time, they're consolidating their supply base. So this is a very virtuous circle. What you can see, what is really pretty fascinating, is that those stores, on average, generate approximately uh, just under three times the average revenue for us per store than all of the other customers outside of the top 20. So this is a very successful customer base, which has been incredibly resilient. And um, uh, clearly many of those are essential retailers and they were far less confined during the lockdown period of the last year than other customers. You'll see on the uh, profile of customers within our top 20 that not all were essential retailers. Some would be more specialist retailers, certainly in the hobby area, but they have very successful e-commerce platforms. So we truly are working with the uh, winners across their various uh, channels. And we feel that the last year, if anything, has actually further enhanced our relationship with those uh, customers. And we've acquitted ourselves very well, but we've got to keep raising the, the bar. And, and talking about raising the bar, our ESG agenda is more important to us than ever before. We've taken this seriously for many, many years, but I would say our customers are increasingly taking uh, certainly the sustainability agenda extremely seriously. And the fact that we are uh, ahead of the game uh, is definitely a competitive advantage. What our commitment is uh, to our shareholders is that in the next year, we will set ourselves specific uh, metrics to deliver on when it comes to sustainability. We will report on those and measure ourselves uh, against that. But there are initiatives that we've delivered on, be it uh, with people in terms of uh, training and in terms of uh, support, if it's product in terms of um, uh, significantly reducing landfill, significantly uh, reducing uh, the plastics that we're consuming, if it's in terms of energy, whether it's solar panels or, or CO2 emissions, we are not just talking the talk, we're walking the walk and, and uh, we take this extremely seriously and uh, we're proud of our track record. We're on a journey, we're not perfect, 
uh, but we're serious and uh, committed to um, to these goals, which we will report on. So, um, in summary, 2021 was not a walk in the park. It was a very challenging year, as I say, for all businesses and certainly for our business. But it wasn't all gloom and doom. We uh, delivered a, a very successful um, acquisition. We've delivered against market expectations, albeit adjusted for COVID-19. Certainly at the outset of uh, the COVID period, if someone would have said to us, well, that will be your outcome for the year, as it has been, we would absolutely have taken it. We were in uncharted territory. We've come out of the year with great relationships, very much intact, in fact, strengthened, and with a very strong balance sheet. We delivered on the synergies of our biggest ever acquisition, and our management team really acquitted themselves extremely well. We are absolutely working with the winning customers, uh, and uh, we see tremendous scope for growth. As for this financial year, our order book is at around probably now just a little bit over $600 million. That's over 60% of the expected revenues. We're very happy with that. Um, there are headwinds. The headwinds are all about cost inflation in terms of materials and certainly sea freight. Uh, we are well placed to mitigate those as, as much as possible, um, but we're, we're in good shape. And uh, certainly from an organic perspective, there's lots of, uh, of runway for us to, uh, to, to navigate. And the M&A opportunity pipeline has gone on to another level in terms of quality and scale. So we're very excited. Uh, we uh, will return to double digit EPS growth uh, during the year. Uh, we feel that we're in good shape to do that. And of course, uh, for the bigger picture, we've got a very exciting growth strategy, uh, both organically and through M&A. And we see that next level of one and a half billion of sales and doubling of EBITDA as uh, very much on course to, to happen. And uh, we have a, a highly um, motivated uh, and capable team uh, to do that. So uh, we would very much welcome any questions that uh, you may have. And again, thanks for your interest. And we've got a question here which asks, can you explain why there's no target for earnings per share growth? As without that, you can achieve your growth targets for revenue and EBITDA through dilutive acquisitions. And I, as a shareholder, will be no better off. It's a perfectly reasonable question. It's, um, the, an the answer is we focused on the, the, the key areas that are, I suppose, things that we think about within the business as at the business level um, what we have a history of doing is is earnings accretive acquisitions that's not going to change um, and we're certainly not going to buy those EBITDA targets and those revenue targets with, without uh, delivering accretive deals so um, we we still talk within the uh, within the RNS about maintaining our shareholder commitment to double digit um, EPS growth on a, on a CAGA base, a three year CAGA basis. So um, that hasn't gone away. Um, these are just headline number, uh, headline targets uh, for the business. We are still uh, very much focused on uh, uh, accretive deals if we do m and Thank you. And you talked about ESG. How closely do you align your goals with your major customers and also with your larger institutional shareholders? Um, as far as our, our customers are, are concerned, I, I, uh, being really honest about it, I think that if I was asked that question three years ago, I don't think we were necessarily acting in parallel with our customers. I actually think we were ahead of our customer demands on many of our categories in terms of uh, sustainability. Now it's much more aligned. I think our customers are really serious about the impact of uh, sustainability. Um, it, it was more also regionally um, uh, noticeable in, uh, say, the UK and, and Europe in particular in terms of sustainability, less so in the United States. That's no longer the case. You know, Walmart are the world's largest retailer and they have an 
absolute commitment to meeting sustainability goals. So now the whole dialogue with them when we are engineering, creating product is uh, very much aligned to uh, demonstrating that we are meeting their goals as well as our goals in terms of sustainability. In many cases, it's actually a more economic solution as well. It never used to be, but because the economies of scale are now there for using sustainable materials and sustainable manufacturing processes, um, it's also become economically sensible. So it's not a nice to have it, it's a need to have. Um, forgive me, what was the uh, question in terms of shareholders? How closely do you align your goals with your institutional shareholders? Um, well, what I, what I would say is from an ESG perspective, certainly uh, more of our uh, shareholders, again, have uh, d definite um, policies and commitments in terms of their ESG goals. And to the best of my knowledge, we are more and more aligned uh, with them. I, I can't come in uh, against individual uh, shareholder goals, but I'm not aware of any that we are not meeting. But I would be uh, uh, pleased to understand if there are any and, and to see what we can do to, to align with shareholders there. What I can say from an IG design group perspective, um, we are committed to meeting goals and we will be increasingly transparent with what they are and how we are uh, accounting for them. Thank you. And what's the target date by which you'd expect your revenue and EBITDA targets to be achieved? Are they two, three years or five year goals? Well, I would say it's up to five years, but we would like to uh, deliver on them earlier. And we think that that's, that's possible. But I would say five years is an outlying uh, deadline. Great. Thank you. And that's the end of questions. Paul, do you have any closing remarks? Well, thank you. Um, yes, I, I can only reiterate that uh, the business, having come through this challenging period, uh, both in terms of strength of balance sheet, strength of the management team, a track record of delivering on uh, very accretive um, uh, op opportunities is very well placed to grow in the, the future. It's not a pipe dream, it's tangible and it's, it's grounded targets that we feel very confident on. Um, clearly, the recent year did not deliver double digit earnings per share growth. We don't like that. Uh, and it's certainly uh, um, uh, inconsistent with the record that we've uh, had previously. But we're very much on track to get back on that path and uh, to uh, benefit uh, shareholders. And uh, we've certainly got a team which is excited for the future. So uh, onwards and upwards, that's my message. <laughs>